Now, we're turning this morning, please, to Peter's first epistle, chapter number four. First Peter, please, chapter number four. And when we come to first Peter, chapter four, come down with me, please, to verse number 12. First Peter, chapter number four, and verse number 12, please. Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, of course, writes, and this is what he writes. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer, as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it be first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And we know that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his own precious truth this morning. If and when suffering comes to the saint of God, if and when suffering comes to the saint of God, what you will find that, that sometimes there are many different steps we take to try and deal with that suffering. When suffering, if and when suffering comes to the saint of God, there are many steps that we decide to take to try and cope and to try and deal with the suffering that comes our way. And oftentimes the steps we do take only add to the suffering and only prolong the suffering. And sometimes, child of God, the steps we choose to take in order to deal with the suffering and to cope with the suffering adds more hurt to the suffering than it does healing. When suffering comes to the saint of God, the first step we must never take when suffering comes we must never play the blame game. You know, child of God, how often we play the blame game when suffering does come. When suffering comes to the saint of God, how often first we, we blame the devil. I know the devil this morning may be the cause. But one thing we must understand this morning is this. There's times when suffering does come. 
And the devil has nothing to do with it at all. Not all suffering, perhaps, that comes to the life of the believer mightn't be the devil's fault at all, but yet no one will blame him. Not all suffering is a result of the devil. And when suffering comes to the saint of God, sometimes we take another step and we blame others for it. We blame this one. We blame that one. We blame the other one. When it's nothing to do with others also. And child of God, sometimes when suffering comes to the saint, Not only do we blame the old devil, not only do we blame others, there's times we blame God for it. How often sometimes we blame God for the suffering that comes. Now I wonder, child of God, are you suffering in some way? And you're playing the blame game. Because that can happen. And that only prolongs the suffering. You see, here's what God wants us to do first. And here's us a, this is a wee lesson that I had to learn. When suffering comes to the saint of God, instead of looking down and blaming the devil first, look within. Because sometimes that's the cause of our suffering. When suffering comes to the saint of God, instead of looking around you, look within first. And when suffering comes to the saint of God, instead of looking up, look in. Do you know why, child of God? Do you know why? Because sometimes... When suffering comes to the saint of God, that suffering is of our own making. Sometimes, child of God, when suffering comes, it's a result of our own making. Not all suffering is a fiery trial of the Lord. Sometimes we suffer because we suffer the consequences of our own behavior. I think of Samson this morning. A mighty man of God he was. But he suffered greatly at the end of his days, a man that lost his strength and a man that lost his sight. Tell me, was it the devil that made him go that way? No, it wasn't. It was suffering of his own me. I think of David. I think of Abraham. I think of the prodigal this morning. Was it the devil? Was it others? Was it God? No. You see, it was suffering of their own making. Wonder is there someone this morning and you're asking yourself the question, why am I suffering? Do you ever think of looking in? Because sometimes, child of God, we suffer. And it's not the devil's fault, and it's not others' fault, and it's not God's fault. Sometimes it's our own fault. And no wonder this morning is there someone here, and you're suffering as a result of your own fault. It's not the devil's fault at all. And there's nobody else to blame, not even God. Here's what the Lord wants to say to your heart. Now listen, friends, I don't know what's going on in your heart. 
And I don't need to know, but God knows. And this is what God wants to say to your heart this morning. Listen, if you're suffering this morning through some fault of your own, and you're suffering this morning because of your own consequence, this is what God wants you to do now. God wants you to stop where you are. And God wants you to draw a line. And God wants you to deal with it. To continue on only prolongs it. And if you're suffering today, saint of God, for the wrong reasons, deal with it today. It's a big step, but it's a blessed step. Saints do suffer for the wrong reasons. But this morning, God wants to speak to us in a different way. Saints suffering for the right reasons. And maybe there's a child of God this morning and you're suffering. And it's not for the wrong reasons at all. It's for the right reasons. <coughs> You'll find my text in 1 Peter 4. And this is where the Lord wants to speak to us from. It's from verse 16. Listen to what Peter says. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on, on this behalf. You know, friend, that's saint suffering for the right reasons this morning. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, I'm telling you, you will suffer as a Christian. And you know, child of God, this morning, what is a Christian? We need to iron this word out this morning because it's the most confused word in today's vocabulary. The word Christian. What is a Christian? You know, the word Christian has been expanded now into something that it's not. You hear of Christian country and Christian this, and everybody's a Christian nowadays. And even the dogs in the street are now Christians. Everything's Christian. Everyone's a Christian. I was listening to the fellow on the TV the other morning. And the whole debate was about something that's totally contrary to Holy Scripture. And this man on television was supporting all what was going against Holy Scripture. And this man said publicly in TV, well now I take the place of a Christian and I agree with it. Oh, everybody's a Christian nowadays. And this is where false teachers are coming in now. If you had been in the Bible class on Thursday evening, you learn that not everybody going about waving the Bible says, I'm a Christian. Is a Christian at all? Yes, but the Bible says, the Lord Jesus says, ye shall know them by their fruits. Do you know what a Christian is? Who a Christian is? A person. A Christian is a person who belongs to Christ. Coming to a Baptist church doesn't make you a Christian. Not at all. Coming to this church doesn't make you a Christian. Come all your life. You're still a sinner going the road to hell. A Christian is a person who belongs to Christ. What is a Christian? He's a person or he or she is one who lives for Christ. A Christian doesn't just belong to Christ. A Christian lives for Christ. A 
And a Christian not only lives for Christ and belongs to Christ, but a Christian works with Christ. What is a Christian? Do you know what a Christian really is? A Christian is a person who one time, in one point, cried out to God as a sinner. That's what a Christian is. A Christian is a person who came by faith and confessed that he was a lost sinner. And a Christian is a person who believes that there's no salvation in any other apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian is a person who has repented of that sin and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now that person belongs to Christ, lives for Christ, walks for Christ. That's what a Christian is. There's people on the road to hell this morning believing they're Christians. Ah, oh, not at all. Oh, no, friend, yet if any man suffer, yet if any man suffer as a Christian this morning, a Christian, a born-again, blood-bought, heaven-bound believer. And Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, child of God, it's so true. You live for Christ. You walk for, with Christ. You belong to Christ. I can tell you now, the more you seek to walk with Christ and the more you seek to live for Christ, the more you become a candidate for suffering. You see, that's suffering for the right reasons, child of God. For the right reasons. I think of Eric Little. Eric Little. Who was Eric Little? Eric Little was a Christian athlete. Running for king and country. 1924. The draw was made in the Olympics that the race would be run on the Lord's Day. And because Eric Little was a Christian, Eric Little wouldn't dis dishonor the Lord by running on the Lord's day. He refused. He took a stand as a Christian. You take your stand as a Christian, you'll suffer. Newspaper reports, headlines all over the place. Eric Little refuses to run for king and country because of religious views. It wasn't religious views at all. It was biblical conviction. Stand for the Lord. Not suffering for a Christian, for, for Christ, as a Christian. And let's come to modern day. I'm not going to mention the name of the company. company. You can guess it. You think of a Christian company in our wee province and in our wee land who recently stood for the Lord Jesus and refused to do something that was contrary to the Word of God and contrary that would dishonor the Lord's name. I'll tell you, because of it, they suffered. child of God the suffered and the big question is today that comes to my heart never mind your heart are you prepared this morning to suffer as a Christian you see that's the godly reason in the text to suffer yet if any man suffer as a Christian when we seek to live and when we seek to walk, to please nobody, not even ourselves, but to please the Lord Jesus, I'm telling you, Brian, it brings suffering. wonder this morning, are you suffering as a Christian in the workplace? wonder this morning, are you suffering as a Christian in the university? I wonder this morning, are you suffering as a Christian in school? Listen, yet if any man suffered as a Christian, listen, you're suffering because of a godly reason. You're suffering as a Christian. I wonder this morning, are you getting it tight in your workplace? Maybe in your school. You're a suffering saint this morning. And you're suffering because you're taking your stand for the Lord Jesus. Listen, you're suffering for the right reasons because it's a godly reason if you suffer as a Christian.
Do you know why so many Christians don't suffer? Because they fail to take a stand for the Lord. Wonder this morning, child of God, as you look at your heart, as I have to look at my heart, are we prepared to suffer as a Christian. The Lord Jesus says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and say all manner of evil against you. You know, that's the godly reason this morning concerning suffering in the life of a saint. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, look at the gracious, the gracious reaction in the text. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Do you know what really gets me at times? People, people saying they love this one and they love that and they love the Lord Jesus. Yet no, they never open their mouth. You imagine, imagine me and Tracy walking up Newcastle Street someday and romance is in the air, the sun's lovely, and the mountains is lovely, and we're walking hand in hand up Newcastle Street. And I'm whispering her into her ear, Tracy, you're beautiful and you're lovely. You know the way old romance takes you over times. And I see some of my friends come on, and I says, Tracy, away you to the other side of the street there and stay there till I, come, till I call you over again. Why? I says, there's people coming, and I don't want to be seen with you. Oh, I, I, I know the reaction I would get. Especially when I got home. I'd probably end up with a friend pan across the back of a napper or something, but can you understand what I mean? You know, child of God, we should never be ashamed to suffer as a Christian. And we should never be ashamed to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he wasn't one bit ashamed to suffer for you and me. That's why. Take a look at the Lord Jesus when they had him tied to that pole and the Roman lash was come down his back scourging him. Big lumps of leather strapped with bits of bone and every time it come down his back it ripped lumps of flesh out of his back and yet he stayed there. He wasn't one bit ashamed of you and me, child of God, when he was been scourged. He wasn't one bit ashamed of you and me when they stripped him. He wasn't one bit ashamed of you and me, child of God, when they spat on his face. He wasn't one bit ashamed of you and me, child of God, when they tore the very hair out of his face. And he wasn't one bit ashamed of you and me when he walked him up Calvary's hill to be crucified, knowing that he wasn't one bit ashamed of you. And he wasn't bit ashamed of me. And he wasn't one bit ashamed of you, child of God. And he wasn't one bit ashamed of me when he was prepared to be made sin for us who knew no sin. Oh, no. He wasn't one bit ashamed when he suffered for you and me and when he hung on that old rugged blood-stained cross suffering such agony suffering such pain suffering such shame oh, he wasn't one bit ashamed of you and me child of God and don't you ever forget that either if any man suffer as a Christian let him not be ashamed. Dear. Oh, friend, there's nobody knew more of this than Peter. Do you remember when the apostles were in prison? Verse chapter, Acts 5, 41 says, And after they had beat them, they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. I'll tell you something now, child of God. Listen. There's no disgrace and suffering as a Christian. There's no disgrace in suffering for a Christian. 
Yes. Child of God, I repeat that. There's no sin, disgrace, and suffering as a Christian. But there is a disgrace when Christians suffer as a criminal. A Christian should feel disgraced when they suffer for doing wrong. Listen, child of God, if the firm that you're working for is asking you to do something and you know it's not right to do it, don't you do it. Take your stand for the Lord and don't be ashamed of it. And even if that employer is a Christian, there are many some Christian employers would put your lights out. Come across Christian employers before. And what they would ask their employers to do, I'll tell you, they should be ashamed of themselves. Don't you be ashamed. <coughs> child of God to stand up to your boss because the Lord Jesus is more important than your boss. Maybe this morning you're asked to do something by your friends. Maybe at school you're asked to say something and you're asked to do something and you know it's not right to do it as a Christian pupil. Don't you do it no matter what the teacher tells you because the Lord Jesus is more important than your teacher. That's if the Lord, the, your teacher, is asking you to do something that you know it's not right to be as a Christian. I remember hearing a wee story one time of a young Christian lad. He was first year at intermediate school in Glasgow. And the teacher was asking him to do something, and the teacher was asking him actually it was to say something, and he wouldn't say it. And the teacher brought him to the front of the, the class, and the whole class was, this young lad was made a spectacle of the whole class, in front of the whole class laughed at him. When the class was dispelled, the, the master called him over. He says, why would you not do it for? He says, because I love my Lord too much to dishonor him. He says, were you not embarrassed when the rest of the class was laughing at you? No, he says, sir, no. He says, the Lord Jesus wasn't ashamed nor embarrassed when they spat on him and scourged him and crucified for him for me. So why should I be ashamed? to take my stand. Yet, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, and listen, hold on, child of God, you mightn't be suffering yet, but you could soon be suffering. That boss, that teacher, could be going to ask you to do something in the day to come, and maybe this message for you this morning is gearing you up and setting you up and encouraging you to take your stand whenever it comes. You see, child of God, what we often forget, we are called to suffer for Christ. And suffer as a Christian. But take a wee look at that text again and listen to what it says. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian. Don't you suffer, Christian, as somebody that diddles the books in the Vatman now. Don't you suffer for that? 
or suffer for this, or suffer for the other thing. You make sure that if any suffering comes, it's because you're taking your stand for the Lord. That's, and let him not be ashamed, the gracious reaction, but here's the glorious result. But let him, let him glorify God on this behalf. What's God trying to say this morning? I'll tell you what God has been saying to me this week. What God has been saying to me personally this week, that when we are called to suffer as a Christian, our main object in the midst of that suffering, whatever it's for, is to glorify God. In whatever way Satan attacks, when we are obeying God and standing for him and doing his will, you remember this. When Satan attacks you for standing for the Lord, you know, friend, you take that as a compliment. You take that as a sign of respect this morning. And don't you fight back if you're suffering as a Christian. Because when the Lord Jesus was revealed, he revealed not. You're not glorifying the Lord if you're running about looking at your rights because you're suffering as a Christian. You let the Lord deal with them and the Lord will deal with them. You take it from me. Your main object and my main object in suffering and our main objects in suffering is to glorify God. Because deep down, the people who are causing us to suffer don't expect you to fight back. 1 Peter 2.21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Are you suffering as a Christian? And Paul and Silas suffered that night down in the Philippian jail, feet in the stocks, their backs red raw, Ah, oh, there was no fighting back, man, the deer, the prayed and the rejoice. But here's something the Lord wants us to finish with. Verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? What's God trying to say to us here? Listen. If that's what the world sees in us as Christians to cause us to suffer, to suffer for the name of Christ, if that's what God allows for you and I to suffer as we suffer for Christ, if God sees fit that his people should suffer for his name, the world sees it as judgment. We were to you unsaved people with this, with this I'm finished. It finishes with this, what shall the end be of them which obey not the gospel of God? Think of a dear unsaved person this morning. If the world treats us the way it does because we belong to Christ, You think of your judgment when it comes from God and you die rejecting Christ. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? The lake of fire, that's the end. What shall the end be of them which obey not the gospel of God? Hell, that's the end. And if you're in this meeting this morning not saved, you consider that question. What shall the end be of me who obey not the gospel of God? I'm telling you, God's judgment and God's wrath and hell will be the end for you. And you might have your funeral service in here. And your coffin can be sitting at the front. And everybody singing hymns around you. Only for you to be in hell. I'm telling you, the Christian suffering in this world cannot be compared to the sinner's suffering 
in eternal judgment. And I want you to think about that this morning. That Christ died for you. And he died to save you. And he came to give you eternal life. But you must repent of your sin. And you must turn round and trust in him. Because you will never escape God's judgment if you fail to do it. It only takes one wee slip to end your life. And when your life ends, there's no more hope for you. Unsafe friend, you seek the Lord while he may be found this morning. Call ye upon him while he is near. Do you see? This is Sunday. See Tuesday. And could happen you the day, and you'd be up at the front here laying in a coffin on Tuesday. And you think hard this morning what your end will be if you die without Christ, who died to save you. Suffering saints for the right reason. See to it that we suffer for Christ and let us never be ashamed. May God bless his word to our hearts this morning. Our closing hymn, 260.